Welcome everyone to today's webinar with Dr. Tom Giannini. Tom is an associate professor here in the Worcester area. He's with Ohio State University on our Agricultural Technical Institute campus, the ATI campus, where he teaches chemistry and he also advises our student beekeeping club. You may remember Tom if you've been a fan of our webinar series. He's taught sessions in the past on chemistry of honey and beehive communication, hive communication. So I'll turn everything over to Tom. So Tom, good morning and thanks. Good morning, Denise, and welcome, everybody. Um, you know, usually I have a, a pretty heavy chemistry emphasis in, in what I talk about, but I think today's uh, there's there's still going to be an awful lot of biology. Um, I'm going to be talking about the role royal jelly plays in honeybee development, and more specifically in, in queen development. Before we um, get to talking about royal jelly, um, I, th I think it'd be helpful if we first discuss the general development of honeybees so that we can understand how and when royal jelly is used in this process. A classic reference for those of you who might like to read more about this topic is Mark L. Winston's The Biology of the Honeybee. Most of the fourth chapter on development and nutrition is, is clearly written in an easy read. The stuff at the very end gets a little heavy, but um, uh, you know, I'm going to be going over some of that, and, and that might help you understand it when you go uh, to read it on your own. The life cycle of a honeybee can, can be divided into four distinct stages, no matter the cast of the honeybee we're considering. They are the egg, larva, pupa, and adult. We will first discuss the features that are common between uh, the development of queens, workers, and drones before delving into the differences that determine the cast of the individual bee. So let's start with that, that first stage, eggs, that first stage of development. Um, when a honeybee queen lays an egg, it's so small that it can only be seen by the naked eye with the light hitting the comb you know, in just the right way. Um, you beekeepers out there know that when you pull out frames to, to look for eggs, um, you know, you're really, you're turning it in the light, trying to get it to uh, hit just in uh, the right direction so that you can see uh, those tiny eggs. Um, in this picture that I'm showing, the comb cells on the right side of the picture contain eggs, while the larger structures on the left are larvae. Now, I've heard the egg described as, as small grains of rice, but I think even calling them a small grain of rice is, is an exaggeration of the size by about, you know, tenfold or more. This egg is the original egg cell laid by the queen and a yolk that the queen lays just before she deposits the, the egg cell. This newly laid egg is is set straight up in the cell in a glue that's left by the queen. But by the time the egg is ready to hatch in about three days, it'll be lying on its side. It, it slowly uh, sags over until it's on its side. Now, one cannot easily see the egg hatch into the first larval stage. And really what's happening here is it's more of a slow dissolving of the uh, egg membrane as this developing uh, embryo grows a little bit and begins to move around. Um, I understand that this is really unlike uh, most other insect eggs where the, the uh, rupture of this membrane when the egg hatches is usually much more dramatic. At this point, uh, the larval stage follows egg development, and this is characterized by uh, a period of uh, incredible rapid growth. Uh, the larva grows from the egg size, th that, that size that we said is so difficult to see, to a white grub-like shape that uh, almost completely fills the comb. Um, the external body parts are undeveloped at this point, but there is a very well-developed alimentary canal. That's the, the internal parts that have to do with uh, uh, get, getting in nutrition and, and digestion. And this includes digestive enzyme producing salivary glands and excretory tubules. The mid and hind gut are also very well developed, uh, or become very well developed in larvae. Food, 
including royal jelly, is placed in the cell by adult worker bees, and the larvae are built uh, especially to lap up all of this uh, food that they can get their um, that they can get to with their simple mouth parts. The other internal structure that develops during the larval stage is a set of silk producing glands um, that will later then convert to salivary glands. They only use these silk producing glands once um, so uh, it's a, a feat of efficiency that then they then are converted to salivary glands for, for use in later life. The cells are capped at this point, and the larva can move about to get any food in, that's left in the cell. And as they grow, the larva undergo five molts. Um, actually, there's uh, five molts in this stage, um, and there's actually one in, in a later stage. So another way to say this is they shed their exoskeletons and form a new one to accommodate their uh, increasing size. Near the end of the larval stage, the silk glands are put to use spinning a cocoon in, inside the comb cell. The larva is oriented head up, typically. Um, feeding has ceased, and the contents of the midgut and excretory tubules are dumped off into the base of the cell. And, and this material is also included in the construction of the cocoon. The comb cells are... Uh, are actually capped in the last few days of this of this larval stage. Also at this point the larva is sometimes referred to as being uh, uh, pre-pupa and it's beginning to resemble an adult bee save for the wings and it's this fifth larval molt that's going to yield the, the pupa and this process is sometimes called metamorphosis. Now queens spend uh, the shortest amount of time in the uncapped larval stage, about three to five days, uh, while drones um, spend four to seven days as uncapped larvae. Workers are in between there. They're like five to six days. Uh, the capped uh, prepupal time period is three to four days for queens, three to five for workers, and four to six for drones. Now the last stage before the final molt to the adult form is called the pupil stage. Uh, external body parts like the head, abdomen, legs, antenna, everything except wings are pretty much in their adult form. Even um, uh, undeveloped wings are, are in place as kind of like small pads. Um, but since they're not needed yet, they're, they're not fully developed. In the pupil stage, though, it's the it's internally where the major changes take place. While the larva was built only for food processing on the inside, the muscle and other internal organs needed by the adult develop during the pupil stage. There's a lot of cell differentiation and growth uh, occurring at this point. The biggest external change is a uh, darkening of the cuticle before the sixth and final molt that reveals the adult bee. Um, cuticle is maybe another word we could uh, use for the, that exoskeleton. The length of the pupil stage is only four to five days for queens, while drones and workers um, go somewhere in the eight to nine day range for, for that uh, pupil stage. And then finally, uh, we get to the adult stage. Insect pupa that molt or metamorph into adults are often called tenorals or, is, or described as being in the tenoral state where the exoskeleton is yet to completely harden. This is also true of honeybees. They undergo their final molt in the comb cell and remain there for several hours while their cuticle begins to harden. To emerge from the cap cell, the tenorals, as they're sometimes called these, these young adults, must chew through the wax cappings and they twist and strain enough to enlarge the cell so they can escape its confines. More time is needed for the wings to unfold and dry and for the antenna and body hairs to dry and to take their final adult form. Total time from egg to tenoral adult is only 16 days for queens, 21 for workers, and 24 days for drones, and that's give or take a day or two in, in each case. Um, these are 
are, are very rough averages. Now, brood temperature and nutrition can affect this time period too. Poor nutrition will slow the whole process, as will um, brood temperature uh, brood temperatures that are lower than the optimal 35 degrees centigrade. Now, all chemical reaction rates are proportional to the temperature under which the reaction is carried out. And the, the numerous biochemical reactions that constitute honeybee development are, are no exception. So even after emerging from the cell, the, the tenoral adult needs another week or more to finally become a mature adult. Its exoskeleton has to harden, and there's a, a period there where the, uh, the musculature has to, to uh, mature, and that takes some time. Glands are also still forming at this stage, and proteins needed to, to aid gland development. Now, workers get this protein from pollen that they obtain um, uh, from the comb, and they obtain it for, for themselves. However, queen and drones initially get this extra protein from brood food that nurse bees feed to them. So thus far, my description of honeybee development has not explained how the different casts are formed. You know, why do some eggs end up as drones, some as workers, and a select few end up as queens? To get three casts, there are two very important branch points along the trail from egg to adult that differentiate between the casts. And once again, Professor Winston provides us with a clear graphical map we can follow as we learn about these developmental branch points or differentiation factors. The, uh, the egg that the queen lays is identical um, for all three casts. It's a cell that results from meiosis. And that's a cell division where the genetic information of the original cell is cleaved in half. So we are at this point in, in, uh, in this map. Uh, we can describe this egg cell as being haploid. Remember I said that meiosis um, leaves the, the cell in half and also halves, halves the genetic information. Now, if left in the haploid state, that is to say unfertilized, this egg is going to develop into a male drone. You can see that here on the right side of the, of the map. However, the queen may choose to fertilize this, with drone, this egg with drone sperm that she's been carrying internally since her mating flight. So this is the first major um, branch point here, whether or not the egg is fertilized. If the egg is fertilized, the queen genetic information in the egg is united with genetic information from the drone, thus doubling the genetic information in the resulting cell. So we can describe this new cell as being diploid. Rather than haploid, it's diploid and will grow into one of the female casts, either queen or worker. Now, this is where the second branch point in the developmental path occurs. How are the two female casts further differentiated? This has to do not with genetics and fertilization, but nutrition. And so this is where we get to, to royal jelly. While all larvae are fed royal uh, jelly for about three days, um, the larvae that are destined to become queens are fed royal jelly throughout their development. Not only that, they're fed uh, much larger amounts of, of all foods than, uh, than workers or drones are. Now, there are a couple questions I have at this point that have to do with decisions made at these two branch points. One is, how does the queen decide whether or not to fertilize an egg that, that she's just laid? So that, that would be up here at this, this first branch point. Um, although there's often pheromonal answers, chemical signal answers to this type of question, simpler answer might be based upon mechanics and the difference in the size between drone comb and worker brood. And as a, as a queen um, lowers herself into a cell uh, to, to lay an egg, she may well be sizing up the size and general shape of that cell uh, with her legs. 
um, the angle at which the queen deposits an eggs, egg in a deeper or shallower cell may indicate to her whether or not the egg needs to be fertilized. In, fa in fact, one uh, hypothesis I've read is that the angle needed to reach a deeper drone cell may, uh, you know, to reach into the bottom of a, of a drone cell may mechanically preclude fertil uh, fertilization. You know, in that particular um, uh, body movement that the queen, ha queen has to undergo to get that deep in the cell, it shuts off her ability to, um, to add uh, drone semen and fertilize the egg. Now this addresses the genetic branch point in the developmental path. But what about the nutri nutritional branch point that differentiates the two female casts? Again, queen cells are significantly larger than typical brood comb. And we have no problem picking out that, that peanut-shaped queen cell that workers build to house a developing queen. Pheromonal cues induce workers to build the extra-large downward-pointing queen cell, as well as feed the larva inside differently from the other larva. So, whether or not a fertilized egg becomes a queen or a worker depends upon late modifications that are made to the DNA in the cell. This is called an epigenetic modification. Another way of stating this is to say that queen worker differentiation is epigenetically controlled. So, moving away from the genetics and just comparing the gross differences between queens and workers, we have an example of what is called phenotypic polymorphism. The phenotype of an organism is determined by the combination of genetic and environmental factors. And when you have two or more phenotypes in a population, we, see, we say that polymorphism exists. Uh, for example, while queen and workers share the same diploid genetic information, Queen ovaries are well developed while worker ovaries are not typically developed enough that they can lay eggs. Um, to be more specific, developmental differences between queens and workers is controlled epigenetically by the feeding of royal jelly. Heavy feeding with royal jelly causes a cascade of chemical reactions that cause a queen to develop. I can be a little more specific about uh, what the uh, epigenetic modifications are, but unless you have a background in biochemistry or cellular biology, it won't be something that you can follow in detail in a, uh, a talk of, of this type. In, in any event, feeding large amounts of royal jelly induces what we call methylation of cytosine in the DNA. Uh, a methyl group is simply a carbon, it's a collection of, of actually uh, four atoms, carbon and three hydrogens. And this group, called a methyl group, is added to cytosine. Uh, in the literature, you'll see this referred to as CPG methylation. The net result of this is that transcription is blocked at these sites in the DNA, and this has consequences, which we'll talk about shortly. Now, let's follow another of Winston's maps. Uh, and following this one, we see that the uh, extra, uh, the feeding extra sugars and, and royal jelly at a higher rate not only stretches the receptor, um, the receptors in the midgut of the larvae, it also methylates DNA at specific places, that CPG methylation. This ultimately leads to the release of ju juvenile hormone, or JH for short, from the corpora alata. The corpora alata is an organ located next to the esophagus of larva and adults. This hormone ultimately influences the differences between queens and workers. And I think it's no accident that this uh, structure is located next to the esophagus because this all has to do with, with feeding. So these differences have to be sensed, you know, right where, where all the action is taking place and the esophagus is a good place for that. Let's talk about royal jelly composition. 
uh, and, and look at the specific um, components that are in there. Um, it's mostly water. You know, if you look at the chart here, we see that it's about 67%. Um, but it also contains proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and vitamins. The carbohydrates are actually simple sugars called monosaccharides. Um, you know, and if that description doesn't sound nutritious, uh, I'm not sure what else I can say, but we're hitting all the, the major groups there. Carbs, proteins, and lipids or fats. Um, the proteins are in the form of enzymes and individual in amino acids. Now, one particular protein is called royal actin, and we're going to consider this special protein in more detail in just a moment. But royal jelly also contains a fair amount of those monosaccharides or simple sugars, like I've said, and the lipid content of royal jelly is in the form of fatty acids at about 5%. Now, 2 to 3% is, is the fatty acid, a uh, specific fatty acid called 10-hydroxy-2-decanoic acid, or 10-HDA for short. Um, there are measurable amounts of water-soluble vitamins in royal jelly, but they're in very low amounts. I said we'd talk about protein royal actin that's in, uh, that's in royal jelly. And uh, when the individual components of royal, uh, royal jelly are separated and fed um, alone to larva, that one particular protein component, royal actin, is enough to induce queen development. So that's really the, the key component that uh, causes that differentiation between queen workers. It's the royal actin. You know, interestingly, interestingly enough, royal actin induces this phenotypic polymorphism in fruit flies as well. Um, now, I'm, I'm not really a biologist. I'm a chemist pretending to be one. But th this fact causes me to wonder if, you know, if Apis and Drosophila evolved from a common ancestor, you know, an example of divergent evolution, or if this is an example of, of parallel evolution. Um, but, you know, you look at the, the two pictures of a uh, fruit fly versus a, versus a honeybee, and they actually do look fairly similar in, in a lot of uh, gross overall ways. A few moments ago, I mentioned that royal jelly contains trace amount of water-soluble vitamins, and they're listed here. We have pantothenic acid, vi vitamin B5, B6, perox uh, pyridoxine. Uh, vitamin C, ascorbic acid. Now, you notice that we don't see vitamins A, D, E, or K. These are known as fat-soluble vitamins. Um, given that royal jelly is mostly water, this is probably no surprise. Even if these vitamins were somehow available to get into royal jelly, they're not soluble in it. So um, that, that's probably why we don't find them in there. Um, royal jelly is found in dietary supplements and consumer products, um, you know, like like propolis and uh, and honey and beeswax. You know, this is something that uh, humans have uh, take from the hive and uh, and you know put to their own use. Um, you know, I have a few examples illustrated here. Now, neither the European Food Safety Authority nor the FDA recognize any uh, benefits to humans from the use of royal jelly. In fact, the FDA has been pretty aggressive in policing what they purport to be false or unsubstantiated claims by manufacturers. So um, if you do a web search for FDA and royal jelly, you're going to find uh, lawsuits filed by the FDA and uh, publicly posted warning letters that the FDA has sent to companies making unsubstantiated claims about their products that contain royal jelly. Uh, on top of that, royal jelly is known to cause allergic reactions and asthma in some people. Um, and this probably has to do with the, the proteins that it contains. So. Since it's an article of commerce, um, there are beekeepers that, that collect royal jelly. And really, the only place you're likely to find appreciable amounts in the hive 
or in queen cells after the fourth day of development when workers have had a chance to really load that cell up with royal jelly to induce queen development. This means that there are only you know five to six months uh, of the year when the brood rearing is occurring on a scale, you know, at, at such a rate and scale that it's going to make royal jelly harvesting reasonable. Also, it's perishable. Um, you know, when you think about the contents there, you know, there's there, there's sugars, proteins, and lipids. Um, you know, like any other food stuff, it it is perishable. And so uh, beekeepers who collect it have to either keep it frozen, they usually keep it frozen, and sometimes they even add some honey or beeswax um, as a preservative. Well, I guess I'm done at this point. I've uh, got through that a little faster than I thought, but I think there's a, a, a lot there to think about. And at this point, if you have any questions, um, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Great, thanks. Denise, Tom. do you want me to go to the pod and, and pick out questions, or would you like to read them off? I'll pull you the first one that came up from Alan, who wonders if it's possible to produce royal jelly artificially and use it to raise queens. Um, I'm not sure if it actually is being produced artificially, but given that it's a specific protein, my guess is that it's probably, um, it, you know, we, we have the ability to, to synthesize proteins. Um, you know, sometimes what is done is that we'll, uh, in the laboratory, they'll put um, the, uh, the genetic sequence that codes for a specific protein, they'll actually add it into a, a, an organism, oh, like E. coli, and then uh, set it to go, uh, to go in a fermentation broth and it just produces all uh, loads of that protein because we've uh, we've artificially programmed it into the DNA of this of this bug um, and uh, um, there is you know royal jelly is used to artificially raise queens of course uh, I couldn't tell you though um, without doing a little looking around whether or not that's artificially produced or if it's what's collected from hives Kilo Charlie asked if you could tell us any more about Royal Acton. You know, unfortunately, I didn't didn't delve into that anymore. I, I frankly, I wasn't sure anyone would find that very interesting. So, you know, I'm not. I couldn't tell you whether it's a a, a, a really large protein or a small one. Um, all proteins are polymers, and the monomeric units that make it up are amino acids. There's smaller organic molecules, and there's there's about 20 amino acids that are that are known, and it's the specific sequence and number of these amino acids in this long protein chain that determine what that protein is and how it's going to act. Um, so there's a lot you can you know you can really get into when looking at these proteins. Their sequence of amino acids, um, how this protein is then folded up, and it's its gross structure and shape, and then how that affects, um, or, yeah, how that affects how it's used. Uh, but you can do this for any protein, and, and a lot of that information is readily available on the web. Okay, Dwayne asks, queens can be of different quality. How does nutritional impact? Sorry, how does nutrition impact quality, or is it just a matter of age if the larva is selected? Um. You know, thinking back to to uh, that that tree that uh, that we borrowed from Winston, uh, where we're differentiating between queens and workers, that's all nutrition based, and you know we're counting on certain events being triggered, and uh, you know by by a certain type of nutrition, and some of these triggers are not necessarily all on or off. You know, they're not always simple switches, you know, on off like a light switch. Sometimes they're more like a slide switch, you know, like a dimmer light um, where you can start to turn it on but not have it turned on very well. And in, in a situation where the nutrition is there but not optimal, you may uh, get queens that are produced, but um, the switch isn't turned all the way on and you're not going to get the 
the best queen. So nutrition makes a uh, has a huge impact on queen development. A related question: Alan wants to know if uh, you know how much royal jelly would a queen larva consume? Oh, you know, I didn't. Those numbers Winston talks about a lot of numbers like that, and I kind of just glossed over them. Is I, um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised uh, th that anyone's that interested. But I suppose if you're, you know, if you're into uh, or thinking about rearing queens, that could be a really important question. Um, I know it's in, in that particular reference, and I have a bibliography that I've added at the end of the uh, presentation here. It goes into a lot more detail than I did in this talk. Um, there's some pretty heavy-duty scientific papers in there. Um, but uh, that, that uh, textbook by Winston is, is a really good place to start. Um, that book was published in 1987. I was looking at that, and I was surprised at you know that that's really a long time ago. Although I was in college then, so I don't think it was that long ago. But but my students today tell me that was a long time ago. But boy, that book is still very very timely, and I think a lot of the those specific number answers could be found there. There are a couple of plant related questions, Tom, and I don't know if that's up your alley or not. But um, one of them is: Are there any studies linking certain plant blooms with royal jelly production? And then a related is, are there any plants that are more beneficial for bees to produce royal jelly? You know, I've not seen anything like that. My guesses would be that it, it wouldn't have that much effect on, on royal jelly. You know, what's really important, and the most important part of royal jelly is that protein, royal actin. And, and bees um, have to put that protein together from amino acids which they get from other proteins in pollen that they break down. So, you know, those, those amino acids are pretty ubiquitous in, in pollen. It's a matter of getting, uh, you know, as long as they're getting pollen, getting those uh, essential amino acids, it's a matter of them in their internal biochemistry, breaking down the amino acids and the proteins that are in pollen, and then reassembling those amino acids in the right sequence and in the right amount to make lots of royal actin. 